to hear an upright bass, much less an upright bass playing Blue Moon of Kentucky coming to you from France. I'm down with it, and that's somebody that I have to have on the show. Welcome, everybody. Chris Jordan here, Talking Sound Podcast. Welcome back. Uh, Our guest today, the amazing Jason Barnard, not only the musician playing that incredible upright bass right there, but also one of the best darn SEO people in the world. We are going to be talking about the world of SERP, search engine uh, return page, like how to make yourself pop up on Google, how to make yourself discoverable on the Internet. This is quite literally one of the hardest hitting episodes of Talking Sound that we have ever, ever produced. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. I cannot wait for it today. When we come back from our commercial break, we will be talking with Jason Barnard, CEO and founder of the amazing CaliCube.pro website, where you can go and learn all kinds of great stuff about discoverability, tools to f- help yourself be found on the Internet. Uh, we're going to be learning so much about what is the nebulous, nebulous world of SEO optimization today, folks, when we come back from this message from our sponsor, Podcast Cadet. Have you considered starting a podcast? Looking for a way to make your business a voice of authority in an industry? Then Podcast Cadet is the solution for you. Whether starting a podcast for yourself, your brand, business, school, church, or just plain fun, Podcast Cadet is here to help you navigate the waters of the podcast industry. Specializing in one-on-one consultation and training with industry professionals in fields ranging from podcast technology and editing to distribution, monetization, and even social media strategies. Podcast Cadet tailors their services to the specific needs of you and your podcast. Do you already have a podcast and trying to find ways to engage and grow your audience? Sign up for your Podcast Cadet audit today and let us help you explore new and exciting ways to leverage your content and elevate your podcast brand to whole new levels. From consultational workshops to affordable podcast production and maintenance packages, Podcast Cadet is your one-stop shop for everything podcast-related on the Internet. Visit podcastcadet.com today to sign up for your consultation or training and use code TALKING20 to save 20% off your entire purchase. That website again is podcastcadet.com. That's right, folks, and, well... Full, full disclaimer, I, of course, am one of the founders of Podcast Cadet. The whole reason that I started Podcast Cadet, folks, was I I spent years in broadcast. I spent years behind the soundboard as an engineer for bands, things like that. And I saw people getting really, really bad advice on starting, starting podcasts, on hosting media, things like that. And... I teamed up with a couple of people that I knew uh, who were speaker trainers, a couple of people that I knew that were brand coordinators, uh, social media folk, and even people like our guest today, the amazing Jason Barnard. How are you doing today? Good, sir. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It's uh, it's delightful to be here. And uh, I'm for once talking about my current subject in the context of one of my favorite ex um, or even actually current uh, contacts, which is sound music, being yeah. a musician and even, in fact, doing uh, TV shows. Absolutely. And, you know, before we get too buried in the topic of SEO, Jason, you have a a storied history 
when it when it comes to these things. I mean, you actively were uh, the voice of uh, a dog on a children's show. You helped start a production company for children's content. Yep. Uh, I was a blue dog in, on a TV show. Basically, with my with my ex wife, we created these two characters. And when we tried to get TV companies, book companies, or record companies involved in our project, they all said, "Ah, two characters, Tom and Jerry, um, whatever other pairs of characters you can think of, been done before. No point." Uh, and we did Boo and Koala, and we believed that it was going to be really, really. Um, valuable i think as an educational tool and it would entertain kids and we were determined so we created a company and released it ourselves and that's what i love is um i i myself as as i was telling you in the pre-show conversation i'm a serial entrepreneur it's one of those mm. when i when i see a need in an industry that i am involved in i I am compelled to move to fill that need. Like if I have the knowledge, the know-how and the perseverance to be able to do it, I'll do it every time, you know, right. and to know that even yourself, whenever you came up with this idea and other production companies were like, nah, 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 not really something that we're interested in. You went out and made a production company to hmm. actively make it happen. And I, I can't give you more kudos uh, oh, in, in the you. universe than that, because it, it literally is what you have to have as anybody in a band, um, any artist, even even as an engineer, you know, as a freelance engineer, there there is that not necessarily uh, swagger, but that confidence of the fact of I can see this through to the end. If I put my effort into it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and it is true. And from my perspective, what I, I mean, I created a record company before I created <laughs> this company. Um, the record company, I then created a, a, a gig organizing company and the gig organizing company and the, um, and the record company were all about the fact that I had a group called the Barking Dogs, which is down at the bottom of this page. And we played folk punk. And we wanted to release records. We wanted to play gigs. We, we wanted, and we were playing in the street and we wanted to play in clubs. We wanted to play festivals. We actually ended up playing on the same bill as Bob Dylan. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, the guy from Black Flag, I can't remember what his name is. Um, Rollins, his name is. Mm. Um, and what, what was interesting there is once again, it was people saying, we, don't want to release your records. We don't want to organize your tours. Yep. And I believed that the group was worthy of records and tours. So I created the company that allowed me then to do that. Um, and obviously the company is simply a way to present it to people and a way to fit into the uh, society, uh, the, the business side of things that you have to deal with, unfortunately. But the, the motivation was simply I wanted to play music in front of lots of people. I wanted to make records and sell records. And I wanted to play a gig with Bob Dylan. <laughs> Who doesn't want to play a gig with Bob Dylan? Um, right. I, I didn't know it at the time, though. I have to say, when I started, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to end up playing a gig with Bob Dylan. But, you know, I, I also played Captain Sensible, the guitarist from The Damned. Oh. In, in a club in, in Berlin. Oh, sorry, in Germany, I wasn't in Berlin, but we ended up, what was really interesting is you end up playing music. We ended up playing music in festivals with all of these people who were my such heroes when I was, uh, when I was yeah. younger, the Pogues as well. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, uh, and, and, and that's a dream come true. It really is. I mean, yeah. I have to say Bob Dylan was a bit of a sulky guy. I mean, he had his, 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 uh, what do you, your dressing room. And I didn't talk to him. I never met him. I just saw him on stage and he was on the same bill as me. So there's absolutely no kudos there at all in terms of anything I actually did. <laughs> but when you're standing there, you're just going, isn't this really bizarre and weird and wonderful all at the same time? Yeah, there's, there's nothing like standing side stage at a moment like that and going, wow, yeah. this is my life. 
<laughs> um, and uh, before I went into the corporate AV environment, I spent years in rock and roll, Jason, as a, not only a, a, a venue audio engineer, but as a, a large venue audio engineer in stadiums, stuff like that. And oh, uh, like, man, to be able to be on the video crew for stuff like Roger Waters, The Wall. Yeah. You know, things like that. Like, yeah, I, I was standing side stage watching Rush play. Like, I, I got to tear down Neil Peart's drum kit. You know, th Ooh. those are just moments in life where it's like, wow, wow. Like, yeah, that happened. That was a thing. Um, and to know that brilliant. you with your music got to have that beautiful moment in life where, you got to stand side stage and see Bob Dylan playing on the same stage that you were just on, seeing the Pogues, people that had moved you uh, mm. to wanting to record music. Exactly. And I, I've got another great story, which is Go which ahead. is absolutely rubbish. I mean, in, in terms of actually achieving anything or doing anything, <laughs> sure, is that. We, we recorded an album in France and I then decided to have it mastered by a guy in the UK because he'd been recommended and he's a really nice guy and I'd met him before. And then I, I, I woke up late the morning I was supposed to be going to do the mastering with him. So I rang him up and I said, I'm really sorry. I'm going to be an, about an hour late. Uh, and he was going to come and pick me up from the station, from the train. And he said, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, you know, I'm not going to charge you anything extra. But the, the money, obviously, from my perspective, was was a big deal because we were a pretty poor group. And then when I got to the station, he picked me up in his super-duper Jaguar and drove me to his house. And he said, it's a real pity you missed the train you were supposed to be getting because the person who was in the studio just before you is Robert Plant. And I had convinced him oh. to stay for a cup of tea so you could have a conversation with him. <laughs> and he had gone. I had, he had had his cup of tea and he had gone. He had left. Oh. So by getting up late in the morning, I missed the possibility of having a cup of tea with Robert Plant. <laughs> How horribly frustrating is that? Oh, that is a that is a heartbreaker right there. Just to just to even <laughs> hear about man, uh, I I had a a similar Robert Plant story. I didn't get to almost have a cup of tea with him, but when I first moved to town, I made very very quick friends with a part owner of one of the live sound companies in town. And the first South by, I w I didn't I wasn't working that gig. I had my own gig with like. The house of Miles Davis that I'd booked out, Ooh. providing the sound, and that was awesome. Um, I worked with them for many years doing that, doing that showcase during South by. But he told me he was like, "Hey, Chris, I, I know you're a huge Zeppelin fan uh, from our conversations. I just wanted to tell you, you you may want to show up to this free show tonight at like ten o'clock." You, you may just want to be right. at this bar. Like, I know you got a gig early in the morning. You've been working all day. Uh, but you may want to just show up. There's going to be a pretty cool surprise guest that hops on stage for a little while. And yeah, it was, it was Robert Plant. Um, Brilliant. who has a house here in town. And, you know, uh, yeah, it was just, it was so cool. Like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. I just got to see Robert Plant on stage. Um, which was really cool in a, very very small venue uh so yeah it's a, it, it, it is lovely i mean kind of you throw yourself into these places and i think kind of part of that is i wouldn't have had that career if i hadn't created the company which is yeah. an, the entrepreneurial part of it but right deep down in my heart it, it's all about playing music entertaining people wanting to be a rock star obviously but also the kind of naivety of actually thinking you're going to make it and that's one of my abiding memories of, of the barking dogs mm. was that we all were convinced that we would be filling these stadiums one day. And it was so obviously not going to happen or unlikely <laughs> to happen. Uh, and yet you, you keep traveling. We did 10 years and 660 concerts and we, wow. we, we truly, truly believed, I think that we were going to be megastars. Uh, and I love the fact that that naivety 
survived such a long period of time and so many kind of obvious disappointments because the number of times you've got those stories with Robert Plant or Bob Dylan or the Pogues, yeah. you've got another hundred stories of when you broke down on the motorway and <laughs> you know you had the you couldn't get to the gig and you didn't get paid and then or, you had to sleep in the in the snow in the yeah. middle of Germany because you were in the van and it was awful, but. It, 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 make, it makes for a lovely, lovely, lovely set of stories. Oh, absolutely. There's nothing like the actual Blues Brothers stories of bands where you walk yeah. out owing the bar money, you know, because <laughs> nobody showed up and you had to do something. <laughs> A hundred percent. And so many good stories, also kind of disappointing stories. And uh, I mean, the, the TV series, interestingly enough, the TV series was much more successful. Uh, mm. The web, It was a website and TV series. We made two albums, uh, released uh, a TV series produced by ITV International, the American, uh, sorry, the UK company, and Radio Canada. It was released around the world, 25 countries, I think. Oh, wow. And it was much, much more comfortable. And I've got, in terms of famous people I've met, loads less good stories. But different stories. And I think I'm thinking about it now. I'm kind of thinking as I talk, but it was for kids. So the, the stories are much more uh, within that. And I'll give you one really nice, interesting one, because we moved to Mauritius, which is in the Indian Ocean, just off Madagascar. Mm. Tiny little island. And we, we moved there because... We thought we can do the internet from anywhere. We can make this TV series, TV series anywhere. And we moved into a, a, a little house on, near the beach and the postman walked by. And I said to him, what's the address of this house? Because we want people to be able to send uh, their drawings, their kids' drawings of these characters to us. And he said, well, there isn't an address. It's, it's the house of Jean, Jean Dutman de Vigny. And that's how we recognized the house. And we were renting it from this guy. And I said, well, can I just give it an address? And he said, yeah, go ahead. And I said, oh, between the sea and the post office. He said, okay, that's the address. That's fine. And our address was then Buwan Kuala, between the sea and the post office, Mauritius. <laughs> and these people, I mean, these parents got their kids to draw had the Buwan Kuala drawings. And we would tell them to send it. It's like Father Christmas, the North Pole. Yeah. Yeah. They must have sent it off thinking, this is never going to get there. And it did every time. Oh, well, what's great, though, is that, I mean, as a marketing person, you could not ask for something more niche <laughs> than an address like that. You know what I mean? Like, you'd pay crazy money to get, like, a street name to have a private road coming to your place. You know, right. to be able to name it after your character or something like that. Like, it literally sounds like part of the show. It's great. Yeah, and it was total luck because the guy basically just said to me, you can choose your own. And that's the first thing I said. I actually then tried to change it. I said, oh, can we have between the cemetery and the post office? And he said, no, nope, you've chosen between the sea and the post office. That's what it's going to be. And I won't accept anything else. Um, and, and it was delightful because in Mauritius, it's such a, it's a small country, kind of very friendly people, very naive. And you, you end up living this kind of terribly naive, out of focus life. You, you're, yeah. you're off, off, off the, the, the kind of the rest of the world. It was, it was slightly strange for 12 years, to be honest. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I bet that I bet that would be an interesting place to live. It, it was phenomenally interesting from the perspective. It was nothing like I'd ever lived on before. And basically, it's living on a, a, a desert island with coconut trees and beaches, and making cartoons for kids, which is a very I, I paint a delightful picture, and it's very, very, very strange thing to have decided to do. But it worked out really well. Um, my daughter, who's now grown up had a whole childhood in a in a in a place where it was warm every day it was sunny pretty much every single day you wake up in the morning and go oh god another sunny day how awful and she would run around on a beach in bare feet she would go and see her friends and it was an incredibly naive and delightful childish upbringing right up until she was 15 which i think we couldn't have got anywhere else well and it that it, to know that you had your children there, that everything revolved around that show while you were there. What at what yeah. point did you start going down the road of 
full on marketing consultant and moving into the realm yeah. of SEO and search engine uh, result page research, stuff like that. Yeah, well, basically, what that's a hard is, pivot. No, it, well, it, it is and it isn't. <laughs> when I tell the story, it doesn't seem like such a big pivot. Um, the, one of the successes of Buwa and Kuala was that we were a very successful site and we were competing with people like Disney and PBS. So we were, we were up there and we had five million visits a month, a hundred million page views a month. So it was. Wow. Food- I mean, we were one of the biggest sites in the world for kids. Um, and as I say, we were on the same level as PBS kids. We were on the same level as the BBC or the CBs, as it was called. And we were a tiny independent country, a uh, company, sorry, in the middle of a country in the middle of the Indian Ocean, absolutely surrounded by the sea and beaches. And it was wonderful. And a million visits a month came from Google. We were ranking number one for kids' games, wow. um, coloring books, coloring pages online, children's songs. We were ranking number one for absolutely all of this stuff at the time. And unfortunately, the business fell apart due to internal debates with my business partner. And I had to find a way to make money to support my family very quickly. Mm. And I had to do it from Mauritius where there wasn't any work for me. And I basically pitched to companies in the UK and said, if I can get a million visits a month for a blue dog and a yellow koala, think what I can do for your company. And that's how I pivoted to digital marketing is basically selling, basically saying, if I can rank number one for kids, games, coloring books, children's songs, I can help you rank for selling cars, buying red dresses and, yeah, you know, business card printing services, whatever it might be. And it worked. It was fine. Well, and, uh, you know, that that's absolutely true, because it it really doesn't matter when it comes to SEO. What the, I mean, I guess it somewhat matters what the business is as to what the keywords will be. But when yeah. it comes to the principles, the practices, uh, it's wash, rinse, repeat. It is it, it, it. There's a lot of it like we were discussing before show. Um, I. I get to sit in the back of a lot of conferences like what people like you speak at. So I have learned a lot of those white hat SEO techniques and white hat Google techniques that, you know, um, as long as you're doing these good standards and practices, you know, whenever you yeah. make a post, make it 350 words or more, uh, put in like at least five links to something else, you know, uh, that that's relevant material. Put in a put in a media player. Put in two or three pictures that are backlinked and have alt tags. And as long as you're doing these standards and practices, you will rank okay. Yeah, I mean, you you've obviously been listening to all these people giving the conferences <laughs> and taking it all and taking notes <laughs> madly. Um, but but that is very true, uh, especially back in the day in the noughties mm. when I was doing my Buwan Kuala site. And up until about 2015, it really was, there was a set of standard practices you could follow. And you mentioned white hat and to point out to people that the opposite of white hat is black hat. Black yes. hat basically means trying to gain the machine, trying to cheat, trying to trick the machine into putting you number one, even though you don't deserve it in inverted yeah. commas. White Hat is to use best practices in an honest and um, helpful manner and try and help the machine understand that you have the best content for its user in the circumstances they're finding themselves, i.e. what they're searching for. Yeah. And the White Hat techniques now, what's interesting from my perspective is we used to be able to just please the machine with some quite simple technical tips and tricks Mm. and it's more and more about marketing and branding now the machine has got much 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 smarter so all of the things you said are 100 percent true still today good but (laughs) otherwise i'm wasting a lot of time with every post (laughs) because in fact what you're doing is building great content that will serve your audience and now if i take that a step further you're building great content with images, videos, podcasts, content, enough content to actually explain to me what it is the page is going to help me with. 
your audience who are a subset of Google's users. And that's the key. You need to create content that actually pleases the audience, your audience, that you are relevant for, who you will be able to help, who are a subset of Google's users who are, whatever, six million, six billion people in the world. And if you focus on that, you're going to be a success in SEO. And if you think about it, focusing on your audience is marketing. Absolutely, because it's all about demographic. It is all about knowing that bell curve of where your audience meets the information that you're giving them. Yeah, hundred percent. And so, if we come back another way, another another point of view on that is Google's role in life, as it were. Its its sole role is to solve its users' problems or answer their questions as efficiently and effectively as possible. And if you bear that in mind, you realize that there is no point in trying to rank in Google, get onto page one for Google, when you do not provide a helpful, valuable answer or solution to its user. Hmm. So you really need to focus on who are we trying to draw in? Yeah. And who do we feel Google can legitimately recommend us to? So we're asking Google to recommend our answer or our solution to its users. And in the context of music, uh, you, you can look quite deeply into that in terms of where would I want to rank, you know, best song. Mm. You aren't going to satisfy Google's users. If you, even if you manage to rank for best song in the world, you won't satisfy Google's users because unless you have, you know, Britney Spears might conceivably managed to do that with Toxic, which is one of the best songs in the world, in my opinion. Yes. Uh, I'm not actually a fan of hers, but my daughter listened to her so much that I ended up... That song it. is a beast. It is a beast, isn't it? And and you end up kind of just thinking, wow, that's really cool. Anyway, back back to back to what we're talking about. Um, the, you want, And the other thing about best song is that it's subjective. So Google would be looking to rank something that would give uh, a range of choices and the, 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 the site or the person that's giving that range of choices, preferably for Google in terms of it serving its users as best it can, would be somebody um, independent who, who, who doesn't have a terrible bias, which obviously as musicians we all do. Mm. Yeah. Now, if, when you're talking about especially a subjective search like that, because uh, like I was saying, there are definitely those best practices. But let's mm. let's get into uh, I guess let's put the big boy pants on real quick and get into SEO and, and what this literal nebulous world of SEO is, because uh, my wife is one of those that. When I try to explain at least my knowledge of SEO, I kind of I kind of see the shark eyes happen, you know. Right. Uh, <laughs> you can see the glaze happen where it's like, wow. Um, and it it really is an ever changing environment. How do you uh, how do you find things like keywords to put in your posts that are relevant? That kind of stuff. Because I guess. A lot of it, especially whenever you're talking about a band, whenever you're talking about website pages for bands, that kind of stuff, a lot of it comes down to keyword search. If you're not, uh, let's say, like a blog or like a podcast where you're putting out like content every week, maybe you have an RSS feed that Google's seeing with pertinent information mm. to the field, all that kind of stuff that help help kind of literally guide Google's eyes to your website. You know, they it's kind of like forming a gravitational field. Uh, once you start putting things like that out, Google just looks at you. Hmm. Um, when you start putting out content on a relative topic every week, um, you know, it it will start to see you eventually. Um, oh. but, but when you've got, let's say, like a static band website with four pages, you know, and maybe once a year you're putting out an album, maybe once a month you're making a band post. How do you find those keywords and stay on top of that and get get a site like that found? Well, there are actually two things, I think. It's an interesting kind of perspective is if you if you're running a blog or a music site or you're, you know, you're posting regularly and you've got this kind of podcast mm. and you've got this, this content coming out regularly, then you would need to research keywords and 
we were talking about it earlier on, a, a tool like SEMrush or SE Ranking or Rank Ranger are, are great, great tools for that. Um, the, the, the idea here is that they will be able to help you understand which keyword terms, what search queries people are actually typing into Google. So if you're going to be doing that, go to SEMrush, go to SE Ranking, and type in the keyword you think might be relevant for whatever article you're writing, and it will show you a list of related keywords that you can potentially think about. And you want to be sure that you're not aiming for the really what we call short head queries. So I wouldn't be aiming for music. Mm. I would be aiming for folk punk music in France, something pretty specific. Yeah. Because I'm a small potato. I'm not going to outrank uh, Rolling Stone magazine. I'm not going to outrank yeah. a major radio station who would be aiming at music and they could potentially rank for that. But I would be able to rank. I would be able to get my site in front of people on page mm. one of a Google result for something where I am, sorry, something specific where I am incredibly relevant. And that relevancy is where you need to focus. It's saying, where am I going to be more relevant than Rolling Stone? And the answer is folk punk music in France. Yeah. And there I can probably nail it. Well, and the thing is, folk punk will narrow down that search query to begin with to probably about three pages on Google. Put in France after that, I, I would nary guess that there would be more than three actual pages of stuff. Well, you'd be surprised. Google will find several hundred thousand, probably millions of pages that are more or less related to the topic. Okay. But truth be told, nobody ever looks beyond page one. Absolutely maybe not. Maybe page two. Yeah. Um, but really, not not, not so much. So basically, yeah. you're looking at saying, if I'm not on page one, I might as well not exist. Well, therefore. It, yeah. No, sorry. And, and really importantly, therefore, I need to aim for things where I am truly pertinent, where I will give a better answer than the big players. Yeah. Uh, and I am more relevant. I am more pertinent. I am more authoritative. I'm authoritative about folk punk music in France, yeah. especially in the 90s, because that's where I come from. Um, so that's a really, really important consideration for you to be making when you're thinking about what kind of terms you're aiming for. And you might think, oh, but there's only 10 people a month or 20 people a month who are searching for that term. But of those 10, 30 people, let's say 30 people, I'll get incredibly interested in my topic and who are potentially going to love my band. If I aim for music, A, I will rank 1,050th. Yeah. And so nobody will ever even see my page. And I will never have a chance of getting anywhere near that page. But if I do rank, they're probably a Britney Spears fan and they don't care about my music. They will never be a fan. No point. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to to bring up what you were talking about earlier, that the odds of taking somebody over on Google in yeah. a search. Uh, uh, my One of my other podcasts, Dudes and Beer, I am getting ready to totally rebrand it um, because... Five and a half years down the road, the show has gone in a different way. We're getting different guests. We have guests. We didn't originally. Um, and it's, it's, it took me, it, uh, probably about six months into my show, I found out that there was a show in France called Dudes and Beers. Wow. And they were like the first three pages of Google. Literally, like my stuff was buried, my friend. Um, but within a year of me posting an episode a week, posting it on social media, putting out, putting out all those things, putting in back tags to topics that we talked about to relevant news articles and mm. all that kind of stuff. Within a year, I was at the bottom of the first page of Google. Right. Brilliant. Um, and that was with paying no SEO person. That was, that was literally just following these standards and practices. And within doing that for another year or so, like now, God bless the guys. I know that they're still out there, but, uh, they, they cannot be found on Google whenever you search dudes and beer. Right. That, that's what you're saying. In fact, I, I call myself the brand SERP guy. 
because I'm a digital marketer who now specializes in what appears when somebody searches your brand name or your personal mm. name or your band name or your album name or your book name or your podcast name. Yep. And it's very much underestimated. Now, one, what you're talking about is basically saying that Google understands who you are, what you do, and who your audience might be. And when somebody types in dudes and beer, you are the most pertinent result now. Yes. So you had to build that over time and you're very, uh, it's very important. I think that you said that took me two years and now I dominate. If you search my name, Jason Barnard, you'll see I dominate totally. Yes, you and do. It looks like I'm the only Jason Barnard in the world, but there are actually like several hundred Jason Barnards in the world. There's a footballer in South mm -hmm. Africa. There's an ice hockey player in uh, Canada. There's a, a university lecturer in San Francisco. Yeah, there um, were there were about four or five that I found on uh, LinkedIn. There were quite right. a few that I found on Facebook, you know, all that stuff. You are not the only person with that unique name in the world. The question is, how do you make your common name unique to the search engine? And, and that's kind of the, 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 that's a really interesting point, especially with band names that can sometimes yeah. be ambiguous, but band member names as well, terribly, terribly ambiguous. And that it, things are evolving pretty quickly in the Google world, but what it will tend to do is show the results where it's most confident. So what you did with your podcast was produce content, indicate that you exist, that you're covering a specific topic and ensuring that Google understands who you are. Yeah. And there you start to nail that SERP. You start to be the result that Google trusts to show its users. But in fact, in truth, what it's trying to do is say, what is the probability that somebody is searching for this specific uh, name? And if you're... I haven't looked at this, but the podcast you're talking about is in France. I would bet my bottom dollar if that podcast is still active, you don't dominate page one. They probably do because the probability that somebody in France is looking for the French one is much higher than somebody in France looking for your one. Oh, are we going to test this out? Let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. I'm a brave guy. I'm not, afra I'm not afraid to show my Google result. There, There's their... There's their stuff. Dudes and Brewery. Um, and yeah. Well, I see two, two dudes, yeah. So I mean, as you can see, it's very geosensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in fact, if, if you were in France, I mean, I'm sitting in France, so I can actually do the, 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 the search. You will see that what Google will try to do is serve what it perceives to be the user's intent. What am I looking for in yeah. France? More likely to be the French guys than you. Now, granted, you take France away. The Dudes Brewing Company, the Dudes Brew, and Dudes and Beer Podcast. So even if you look up their name without the country, I come up before them. Right. And, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, there they are. Boom, dudes and beers. Um, but my Audible and my Facebook comes up before them and my homepage comes up right after them. So, and it's, it's one of those, like, when, whenever I speak at conferences, uh, Jason, the one thing that I try to explain to anybody getting into podcasting is it comes down to two things. Doesn't matter if it's your production, social media, show notes. Uh, SEO website, it's time or money. Which one do you have? If you've got time, just work on it, man. Keep working on it. Keep working on it. Keep working on it. It will mm -hmm. eventually pay off with Google. If you have money, you can make it happen a whole lot faster. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and, and kind of just, just one thing I've just looked in, I, I've used google.fr, which you didn't, and I've searched mm -hmm. in French. Oh, and, you know, I've got their Facebook, I've got their Twitter, I've got their website, I've got another thing, which is a brewery. And in fact, you are there, which is really interesting is it's pulled up your podcast. Nice. In podcast boxes, which, <laughs> which sorry, which actually indicates something really interesting is what Google is has understood you so incredibly well 
that it's willing to put you out there in France because it thinks it might potentially be something I might be interested in, although the probability is much more towards the French versions. So what you're saying is very, very true, is that you can easily dominate or relatively easily dominate your, your local geo market, but potentially you can do what I've done with my name, Jason Barnard, or Dudes and Beer, and you can actually get presence where you don't necessarily deserve it and get that visibility on somebody else's brand name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's literally riding their wave, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting because with that show in particular, it's been around for so long and it, I've got a bunch of pretty world renowned authors in, in those realms that come on the show. And even they sometimes after like their third appearance are like, man, I search myself and I find you now <laughs> um, because they've got like a static author website, you know, um, and that's cool. But if you aren't changing those keywords, if you aren't keeping up with that kind of stuff, if you aren't putting out some kind of regular content, I am and I'm backlinking you and I'm backlinking your stuff and I'm tagging your photo with your name um, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, whenever they go to find pictures of themselves, they see like one or two of them at a conference, then like my episode tile with their name on it. Right. You know, um, that kind of which, stuff. Which is a, a great, great, great kind of strategy uh, from a podcasting perspective. Uh, I mean, it's squatting other people's SERPs and, and getting yourself some visibility by being on their search engine results page when people are searching for them. Yeah. And, and that brings me to the, the, the point. The second point is Please. rather than, I mean, if, if you're a band or even a podcast, one strategy you might want to look at is not so much looking for keywords to rank for, but looking to brand yourself so people search for you. Because one of the strongest signals that for Google that you are relevant to its users is people searching for you in volume. That's point number one. Point number two is in order, well, once people are searching for you, obviously they're interested in you. So it's, it's an audience that are almost won over. So uh, if we talk in marketing terms, rather than being top of the funnel, they're going to be bottom of the funnel. So they're very easy to bring on board and, and get involved in what it is you're doing. And another interesting point is all of these other platforms, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, the social platforms, even Bing, obviously, and, and, and Apple, they're all building very similar kind of algorithms that try to understand who it is we're talking about. They're trying to match their users with you if you are an appropriate source or piece of information or piece of content for them. And so creating that content that you were talking about becomes incredibly important and making sure that, that content is incredibly focused on your core audience is incredibly important. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is Google Discover, which is what's coming or started to come already, and I don't know if, how many people are actually using it. When you swipe right on your uh, Android Google phone, you get Google Discover, and it shows you what it thinks you might be interested in. And for a podcaster or a musician, that's the place to be. That's when Google is saying, "Interesting, we understand you as a user. Let's say I'm searching. It understands what I'm interested in. It knows that I like folk punk music. Yeah. It knows that I like swing jazz music. So if I'm if I've been searching around those topics a lot, and then I swipe right on my Android Google phone, it will show me the group that it has understood to be that type of music, i.e. the music that might well appeal to me. So if I'm a folk punk group, if I can get Google to understand that my page, my homepage is about folk punk music, it will potentially show me in Google Discover to a user who didn't even search for me or hmm. didn't even search for the folk punk aspect of it. I'm being pushed, my, my folk punk page is being pushed to somebody who Google thinks is going to be interested in my music. And that is going to be very big. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that is literally a whole new, whole new realm of AI yeah. algorithmic search to have it because I mean, of course, who doesn't ubiquitously have a Google account of some sort? If you're watching any type of YouTube or anything like that, 
you've got a Google account. Um, if you if you're listening to podcasts on Google Play, if you're I'm trying to remember, is Google Music even still a thing? I think they dropped. No, I, th- I think it's it, it's now been integrated into YouTube Music. Yeah, it has. You are correct. So even then, um, YouTube Music, anything like that, like it will algorithmically know what you would be looking for on a Wednesday anyway. Yeah. You know? and, and it's looking to push that towards yeah. you. Another interesting thing about YouTube, wow. which I which I really enjoy. I mean, if that wasn't big enough, we've got another biggie here. Is that it? It, it builds playlists much in the way that Spotify mm. does. Yeah. Uh, and for example, Buwan Kuala, the music we did, we never created a playlist for it. Google did it, or YouTube rather did it algorithmically. So there is a whole playlist with all the songs. And all it needed to do was understand which songs went together for this specific artist and presumably also which groups go together or which songs go together within a different, within a specific genre. So you end up with this idea of these machines, be it YouTube, Google, Google Discover, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, obviously LinkedIn less, less appropriate to musicians, but certainly good for podcasts is that they are curating content, using machines to create curate this content, bring it together and say, this is a list of songs, podcasts, whatever it might be, that you, the user we have understood, is going to be interested in. So we're looking at these push technologies that are pushing us towards their users. And what we need as yeah. artists, podcasters, musicians, uh, or writers for that matter, is to ensure that they've understood who we are, what what kind of content we're writing, what kind of content we're creating, and who our audience is, which is the crux. Who we are, what we do, who our audience is, and we need to communicate that to Google incredibly clearly on our own websites. Because just to finish this point with this kind of whole round here, is you think, oh, well, there's no point doing on my website because my website doesn't rank in Google. Google doesn't think it's important. Google is actively looking for the place where each and every group lives online. Yeah. It's actively trying to figure that out. And all you need to do is help it figure it out. Once you've done that, you can explain to Google who you are, what your audience is. Sorry, what, who you are, what you do, and who your audience is, at which point you have that opportunity to be included in Google Discover, to be included in YouTube playlists. Yeah. And all of these other machines are going to be the same. Wow. Now, how much does that come down to uh, just... Uh, to bring it back to the uber nerd level real quick Mm -hmm. Uh, how much does that come down to like the description that you put into tools like yoast seo things like that that are like the the description of your website well um yoast seo isn't actually necessarily a good example because google doesn't use the description that yoast provides when you put it into yoast Yeah, it doesn't use it, sorry, to rank and it doesn't use it to understand. It uses it to double check it's understood the content of the page. So your meta description, which is what you're talking about in the Yoast, is actually designed simply to confirm to the machine that it's understood what's in the page because the machine is now reading the page. Gotcha. And writing on the fly a summary of your page. What does that mean? It means that if your description isn't clear, If your description doesn't make sense and it doesn't describe who you are, what you do, and who your audience is, I keep saying it, but it's incredibly important, you're dead in the water. Your description on your homepage of your group needs to be clear and it needs to be understandable by a machine. So typically what people will do, I mean, I'm going to make up a a silly sentence off the top of my head and say, you know, the barking dog's amazing musical geniuses of the 1990s in France are one of the amazingly best ever Pogues-like, Tom Waits-esque folk punk groups. What I've done there is I've separated what we call the semantic triples, which is actually just subject, verb, object, with lots of superlatives and and, and different words that just confuse the message. And what I need to say is one of the leading groups in France in the 1990s, the Barking Dogs, is a folk punk group who have been compared to the Pogues and um, I forgot who else I said. Yeah. 
Um, and, and so what I've done is brought the subject verb object very close together. Mm. Now, A, that makes sense to a machine because a machine can get to grips with it because that's how it functions. It's trying to break your sentence down and understand your sentence as a human being would. But in fact, as a human being, that actually makes more sense to me as well. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, it's really skipping a lot of hardcore descriptors, skipping a lot of uh, not being so verbose. Hmm. Really, really simplifying sentences down to the the nuts and bolts of what they are. Yeah, and, and simplifying the sentence or the structure of the sentence doesn't mean being boring to people. Yeah. You can still use the great adjectives. You can still be uh, expressive. I mean, I did my phrase was, in fact, one of the leading po uh, one of the leading groups in France in the 1990s. The Barking Dogs is a mm. folk punk group. I've still said all the things I wanted to push out to my audience so they understand how incredibly important the Barking Dogs were or, in fact, were not. But that's another <laughs> another debate. Um <laughs> I didn't make it more boring. I simply put the parts that are important together. The Barking Dogs is a folk punk group, allowing Google to understand that and then match it to the audience who might potentially be looking for me yeah. or might potentially appreciate me. So don't mistake writing so that the machine can understand for writing so boringly that nobody's going to ever going to be interested in what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that that's a really good point because uh, you don't want to strip things down totally. You just want to make it – you don't want to make sentences wordy. You don't want to make them long. Um, I, I yeah. will admit I am, I am an offender in that way hmm. when it comes to posts. Uh, the day that I hit, like, orange – on my on my SEO rankings with Yoast and stuff on my descriptions and everything else, um, I just stopped, man. <laughs> I was like, I'm sure I could dig this hole forever to figure out sure. how to write every single post this way. Um, are there tools that help you do that, Jason? Are there things that you guys at Calicube Pro have gotten together made for people uh let's let's start getting into you your service specifically what y'all do there at calicube right well i mean uh there are there are lots of lots of tools working out there trying to get us to a point where we're writing better for the machines uh, i think what calicube does better than most is to try to get people to write better for machines whilst also remaining pleasant and uh, attractive to human beings. Yeah. Uh, but we're actually specialised in a really specific area, which is um, the brand SERP. What appears when somebody searches your name or your band name or your company name or your book name or your album name? And that actually, a lot of it comes down, it comes down to the thing we were talking about earlier on, which is Google is actively looking for where the band, the brand, the person, the album lives online. And if you search my name, Jason Barnard, you'll see that jasonbarnard.com comes up top every single time because it knows that Jason Barnard lives at jasonbarnard.com. It could actually have been the brand SERP guy.com and it would still rank number one if I pushed it hard enough. Um, but it's looking for that understanding of saying, who is this person and how can I represent them? And it's representing me in a manner that I've convinced it to represent me using CaliCube Pro. So that's what CaliCube Pro does. And on the right-hand side, you can see that knowledge panel, which is basically Google saying, or on the left-hand side, it's here are some options. On the right-hand side, it's saying, here are the facts that we've understood. And I've been feeding Google with these facts for years and years and years, and it knows who my parents are, my songs are, and this, and, and the people, who, sorry, my social media accounts and people I'm associated with within my industry today. And it's incredibly important to get that to work if you're going to do yeah. uh, the work to get, to get your brand name or your band name or your, your personal name, whatever it might be, out there so that people are searching for it, so that when they do see this result they see something positive accurate and convincing that reflect the what you want them to see your brand message and that's what calicube does and part of that is we've got a tool within calicube pro which actually helps you write the description and the description is phenomenally important how well does google understand what it is describing 
Yeah. And in, in, in my case, you know, um, when the description I have for myself, it's very clear to Google that I'm describing this Jason Barnard and not another one. For a group, it would be the same. And if, if you actually look up uh, Buwa and Kuala in Google, we should be able to have a look at something quite cool from a, a musician point of view. Um, oh, God. B-O-O-W-A. Oh, there you go. Buwa and Kuala, musical group. Oh, you had it. Did I? What? Yep, oh, yeah. there it is. Third one down. Wow. And and that in and of itself will show you folks the intelligence of Google. I have not searched Boo Woo and Koala on here. But you search for Jason Barnard. But I searched and it you. knows that Jason Barnard and Boo Woo and Koala are related. I search. Well, not just that. I also clicked on your Boo Woo and Koala page earlier. Brilliant. All that yeah. kind of stuff. So, like, that's why Google presented that to me when I just put in the letter B within a certain time window even of searching you in this information. And and that's the important thing is once it's understood that I created Buwan Kuala with my ex-wife, once you search for me, it knows that you're likely to be interested in Buwan Kuala, especially if you've already clicked on yeah. the link. But if we go back to Buwan Kuala, uh, you, your screen, I think we might be able to do something pretty cool. Yeah. As if you scroll down a little bit, it, it's a musical group. It's it's really focused in on the music. You can see there just below, you've got this big description on the on the right hand side, mm -hmm. and that comes from my site. Google trusts me to explain who Boo and Kuala are, and it's presenting it as fact to its users. And I get to write that text. I get to communicate to Google who Boo and Kuala are. Yeah. The ultimate aim for myself would be that it would allow me to do that on my own knowledge panel. I.e. when you search for my name, the description on that right-hand side, which is fact in Google's mind, is my own description. If you keep scrolling down, we come to the songs. There you go. Hang on. Uh, oh, sorry. Go back up a little bit. Oh, yeah. And as you can see, it's associated the barking dogs with Buwan Kuala because I was in both groups just below. Yeah. There, you can see the barking dogs there. It's associated. And my mother. So... Pfft. It, it understands those relationships. And if you click on albums, 53 bright songs from the TV series. Uh, that, uh, the up, up, up. There we go. Yep. There you go. And you can see, if you scroll down a little bit, that it's got the... If you click on songs on the left-hand side, it should... On the left-hand side, yeah, there you go. It should list that. There you go. Songs. It's listing out all 53 songs from the album. Wow. And wow. What, but what's interesting there is it won't do it for most albums. The reason it's doing that is because I created a page on my website for the album and for every single song on the album, and I explained to Google that all of these songs belong together on this one album, and it has reproduced it in the cert thanks to the work I've done on my own site that it recognizes as an authority for Bu Kuala. Now, I'm I'm going to I'm going to be straight with you man. Um I'm going to have to go back and rebuild some of my sites right now. <laughs> no, literally because at one point I had them paged out like that. Page and page and page and page and page, you know, where like the page wasn't public up on a tab, but if you clicked something it would take you to a page. Right. Um and I stopped doing a lot of that. How important is that like to give, and I think I think a, a lot of it was my fear for the fact that it was affecting my site speed having right. so many pages uh how how important is hosting company when it comes to such things and how important are the pages and things like that to your general site speed which is now up within the top 3 um Google search algorithm rankings. Like if you don't have decent site speed, if you are not mobile friendly, and they've been telling us this as designers for years, folks, mm. years, like the last at least three years, get ready. It was it, the big one now is, of course, if you don't have an HTTPS, that's number one. You will be delisted. If you are not, if you are not mobile friendly, be ready to be listed at the back of the line. If your page mm. lags, be ready to be listed toward the back of the line. Those those are, if I'm not mistaken right now, pretty much the top three things 
in the Google search algorithms, right? I would actually beg to differ. Oh, I'm okay. Afraid. Go ahead, please. Um, well, mobile friendly is s- s- phenomenally important. If, yes. you, if you're messing up on that, yep. go home. Yeah. Um, HTTPS is a, a tiebreaker, basically. If, if you're tying with somebody else for second place, it, it will give you the second place if you've gotcha. got HTTPS. Uh, so it, it, it only becomes important in very tight situations. All right. The site speed is very important, but not in this kind of search. I.e., when I'm searching for a brand, the site speed will not have such a very big effect on any rankings because Google is trying to present me with the brand or the okay. band or the person that I'm looking for. And the fact that the site is slow is not necessarily such a big problem. Okay. So if I'm looking for these specific songs within an album, it's not going to say, oh, this, this particular song page is a bit slow. I'm not going to show it. It's going to say they're looking for the song, so I'm going to give them the song. And the fact that it's a bit slow, bad user experience, that's not great for anybody. I wouldn't advise anybody to have a slow site. But it shouldn't be your obsession in this particular context. If somebody's looking for you specifically, your album specifically, your podcast specifically, yourself specifically, the most important thing is that Google understands who you are and it understands yes. where you live. And we call them entities. They're things. I'm an entity. You're an entity. Your podcast is an entity. Buwan Kwal are an entity. The album is an entity. The songs are each entities. And what Google is trying to do is say, where does this entity live online? So that when somebody searches for that entity, that thing, you, me, your podcast, my album, the song, whatever it might be, I want to send them to that place where that entity officially, in inverted commas, lives. And that is the crux in this specific uh, context. So we're not talking about keywords like buy a red dress or best song in the universe. We're talking yeah. about specific names of specific people, bands, podcasts, songs, whatever it might be, but, okay. but specific things that we're looking for. So, uh, and this is my specialist subject. So you should never start me talking about it because I go on and oh, on. And on. Notice I'm, I'm just quiet right now. <laughs> I'm soaking it up, man. <laughs> And, and well, it's it's actually my specialist subject, and I think I'm the only person in the world who's actually specialising in this. And as you can see, there are eleven million nine hundred thousand results for the term Jason Barnard, my yeah. name. And yeah, everything on that page is me, and that's because I have worked so very hard over seven years to make sure Google understands who I am, what I do, and who my audience is, and all of these results represent me in the way that I want to be represented because I have convinced Google that the home of Jason Barnard is jasonbarnard.com and I can just explain to it from that what I call entity home yeah what I want what message I want it to present to my users or my audience rather its users and as long as that representation that I'm asking it to present is honest helpful and valuable to my audience it will basically say what I want to say. And a really interesting point here. If you search Jason Barnard, the uh, strange brew, there is actually another Jason Barnard who has a podcast. Pardon my finger fumble. He doesn't get a look in. He absolutely doesn't. There he is. Jason Barnard, strange brew. He comes up as an option. And this guy has got a, a podcast which, which is actually more popular than mine. But you never see him. And it isn't because he isn't important. It isn't because he isn't popular because he is. He's got some amazing interviews. If you're interested in really groovy interviews with really groovy musicians. Goodness, man, he's one of the Daily Telegraph's recommended podcasts. That's huge. It is, but he doesn't get a look in. And I really, really feel bad for him because it's not (laughs) fair. (laughs) And he doesn't get a look in because Google's so confident confident in its understanding of me. Yeah. That it it kind of thinks, well, I'll just show what I'm really confident in. Here you go. We'll show you this, Jason Barnett, because I know what we're talking about. Um, and, And that is very indicative of the fact that he's actually more famous than I am, especially in the UK. Wow. But I still dominate because Google's so confident in what I've fed it. And he hasn't actually done that work of having the entity home, the place that he lives 
on the internet for Google to hook onto. And, uh, you know... That, and I'm that, sorry, Jason Barnard, if you're watching. That, you know, um, Jason Barnard, I hope you are watching. I, I really do, because this is something that I'm, I'm very... I'm good friends with uh, Todd Cochran. He's the CEO and head of Blueberry Podcasting. Oh, and, my, oh, I use Blueberry. I think they're great. Oh, my God, man. Todd and his team are so fantastic. And Todd is yeah, one of the 100%. straight up, like, if you're ever at a conference, man, and you have a chance to go hang out and have a beer with Todd Cochran, do it. I will. I will. He I is mean, one I, of the I, greatest guys in the world. Um, but we well, are. Sorry, just when I when I set up my podcast, I asked a friend of mine who does podcasting. Excuse me, and he 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 gave me lots of advice, and one of them was Blueberry, and that was the right piece of advice. Oh yeah, absolutely, because it it takes care of that description stuff. It makes sure that yeah. you're doing all of that. You know, and when it, you ask the support guys, and you've done something really stupid with your RSS feed, they explain it to you, and 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 they don't. You know they don't they don't judge you. They just say, "Yeah, they don't." What you need to they do. don't it and they guy explain you. that. Yeah, <laughs> no, I love them. I think they're great. Yeah. Well, and Sorry, uh, anyway, the the thing is, it well, we are so huge in the podcasting community about telling people own your URL. Yeah. Stop doing the SEO work for the platforms. Hmm. Because by the time, if you ever intend to do this and like monetize it, if you ever, if you ever intend to monetize your stuff, anything like that, you're eventually going to get to a point that when you do have a URL, good luck ever getting that to list over iTunes. Good luck, good luck ever getting that to list over whatever hosting platform you were using, you know, um, because you've been 100%. doing all that SEO work for them. Not necessarily I, I, for your brand. I think that's that's an incredibly, incredibly important piece of advice. Um, and I think it's vastly overlooked. I mean, it yeah. comes back to what I was saying, the entity home. Google yep. wants somewhere for your podcast to live. It wants to understand where it lives. And if you just use iTunes and Google Podcasts and whatever the, the other platforms are, Google will think it lives there. Yep. You want to make sure that you control the URL. That's right. The entity home, as I was calling it. You want to control that URL because you want Google to understand that that is the number one result for your podcast when somebody's searching for it. And if you, as you said, hand it all over to iTunes, yeah, you're, you're going to really struggle to, to get that back. Um, and I, I think yep. that's a, a really, really, really important piece of advice that you've spotted yeah. right off the bat. Thank you. And Thank most you. marketers, most SEOs, most podcasters, most groups completely fail to see. People people are, and the thing is, it's it's the rush to be found inside as an artist. That's what leads people to putting their music up for free on SoundCloud before they buy a URL. Cool. Use SoundCloud as an embedded player, what have you. Absolutely. Don't not put your music there. But yeah. man, Buy your URL, embed that in there, but have everything come as as Todd Cochran puts it, have everything coming out of Moonbase Alpha. You and everybody going mm. back home. You right, and, and and SoundCloud being a great example of saying I, mean, I was talking about the songs that I got yeah. listed for Boo and Koala. Every song has a home on my website, and it, it, it the song is embedded from YouTube, which is great. Yep. But Google understands that the song has a home, and that home is my site that I control and that I can, as you were saying, eventually monetize maybe. Yeah. Um, it goes for my podcast. It goes for my each podcast episode. It goes for my uh, music group, my music albums, my music songs. I don't know why I said music songs, because a music song is kind of <laughs> saying the same thing twice, isn't it? <laughs> Very stupid. But... But I think that's phenomenally important. And uh, you kind of think, oh, it's going to be difficult. And the one last thing that I'd like to add to Please. this, which is really important, is you will set up this site and it will not rank. And it will not rank for a long time, multiple months potentially. And you will get frustrated and you will think it is not working. It won't even rank for the exact term of your name or the exact term of your podcast episode or the exact term of your podcast. Don't give up. 
stick yeah. with it. Yep. Make sure that SoundCloud, Blueberry, uh, iTunes, Google Podcasts, whatever it might be, they all point a link back from each and every one of these to that place where your podcast podcast episode lives. Yep. Google will end up understanding. And once Google understands, it is actually very keen and very enthusiastic to use you, the creator, the owner of this thing. It would prefer to. For yourself. Yeah, exactly. It would prefer to. It would be easier if you gave it a place to just find you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing, and hey, let, oh, let's try another trick, because the other thing is once it's understood where you live on the Internet, if you search for who played the double bass on the Ace of Spades, yep. it's a bit of a long phrase, but we all know that it was Lemmy Kilmister from who played the bass. Sorry, it, it needs to be who played the, the double bass on the Ace of Spades. There we so go. It, uh, the, the query, rather than double bass on the Ace of Spades, it's yeah. who played the double bass. It's a question of who yeah. played the double There you go. Jason but, Barnard. But, and that's on my site. I told Google. Now, if you try taking out the word, sorry, to explain to people, what I've done is created a page that says, I played the double bass on a version of the Ace of Spades. And now... When you ask Google the question, who played double bass on the Ace of Spades, it says me. Now, if you take out the word double from the, from the, the query, yeah. I never said I played bass on the Ace of Spades, but sometimes, uh. there you go. It says Jason <laughs> Barnard played the bass on the Ace of Spades, which is totally not true. So what I've done is I've convinced uh. it so much that I'm the great source of information about me. It's taken that to be... You know, it, it said, well, base, double base, same thing. We'll just show Jason Barnard. And it's frankly not true. And it wasn't my aim. But that shows you the power and the control yeah. you can have. Yeah. If Google understands you to be an authority on yourself. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, that's one of the biggest things that it, whether it's music, whether it's podcasting, what have you, like we were saying earlier, as as artists, we need to have that swagger. We need to be we need to be ready and willing to put ourselves out there in that way. Mm. Uh, and we need to be ready to literally push the envelope when it comes to getting ourselves and getting our art. Like we need to be just as passionate about promoting our art as we are about making our art. And I, I think that's where uh, whenever uh, bands would ask me to come in and be their sound guy or help them produce things like that. Um, the one thing I would always tell them is whatever time we spend in this studio together, we all have to promise each other that we will spend three times as much time that week outside of that studio promoting this band. Brilliant. Um, and it's very much the same way with this. You, if, aside from doing your due diligence, you got to put work behind it, whether it's telling Google about your band, about your podcast, about your t shirts for your band, what, what mm. have you. You've, you've got to put the work behind it. You can't just put it up and expect it to happen. The, the example I give people is you, you've, you've raised this beautiful fish from a minnow and and you've decided to let it free to free range in the ocean of fish have have you found a way to find your fish in the ocean do you do you have a way to let people know how to find your fish amongst all those fish in the ocean because that's what you're trying to do with seo is geotag that fish you're you're trying to make it so that it's easy to find that fish amongst the ocean of very similar fish. And yeah, and interesting. I, I I like this because we can also say we also want to make sure that Google can really quickly, easily, and um, reliably identify your fish when somebody's looking for it, and just pluck it out of the water and show them show them the right fish. Yeah. Uh, and and we forget that. And I think, uh, as you're saying, 
this idea of entity home, having a website, buy your URL, control that domain. Um, if you've got a record company or a production company, don't think they're going to do a great job. Don't give them ownership of your no. URL, your entity home, mm-hmm. the place that you live on the web. Keep that to yourself because that is where all the, the, I was going to say power, but that's not the word. It's that when somebody is looking for you as an artist or as a podcaster or a, a music album, Google will send them to you first yeah if it understands that that is where the official um artist creator yep. producer whatever it might be actually is yeah yeah and and i'm i'm here to tell you folks any producer or label that's telling you otherwise you really need to reconsider that relationship because that means they're trying to get their stuff found over yours um and that that I think is hugely important to point out. Uh, I can, yeah, go ahead. No, and 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 it is very important because uh, if you look at uh, if you look at some artists, I think it was Steve Carell. Mm. When you look at his, if you if you pull up Steve Carell on 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 your screen now, we'll see something actually quite interesting. I'm going to compare myself to Steve Carell. So if we pull up Steve Carell, you will see Wrong on that right hand side that factual result you will see that there's a little world icon there with Twitter next to it. That means that Google thinks that Steve Carell lives at Twitter on the internet. Basically, that is the reference point for Steve Carell on the internet for Google. That's its entity home. Now, that means that Steve Carell, the truth that Google understands comes from his Twitter account, which is great. But what happens if Twitter closes down? What happens if Twitter closes his account? Yeah. What happens if Twitter gives his handle to somebody else? Yep. He's got a big problem. Now, if you search for Jason Barnard, you will see that same little world icon and you will see jasonbarnard.com. Nobody else controls that. Nobody's going to change that site without my permission. That's right. I own the place that Google associates with the most uh, the most authoritative, trustworthy, and valuable information about me. Steve Carell is leaving that to Twitter, which is a foolish mistake. Oh, absolutely! I didn't even see a stevecarell dot com in that first uh, in that first half of a page that no. I scrolled down. And as anybody like, what image consultant do you have? What management yeah. do you have that has not purchased your dot com? Or had you purchase it and build at least a splash page, man? Well, interesting <laughs> enough with uh, CaliCube. Well, at CaliCube Pro, we've we've got quite a lot of kind of PR companies using it, and I've got quite. A, Steve Carell isn't one of my clients, but we do have some very famous clients. And the number of times that they turn around to us and say, "But I don't care about Google results." And my immediate reaction is, "What planet are you living on?" Oh, yeah, but I'm focusing on Facebook or I'm focusing on LinkedIn. or I'm fo- And he's saying, at some point, your fans, people who are interested in you, are going to be searching for your name on Google. Yeah. And it, saying, I don't care about Google is stupid in the, the extreme. And that's just it. There is a an ocean as well as a chasm added to that ocean of difference between discoverability and presence on the internet yeah. and interaction with an audience. Totally Brilliant. different. What I do on dudes and beer on Facebook is totally different than what I do on the website. Like 180 degrees. Mm. You know? Um the 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 Facebook is where I is where I go to engage my audience. That's where I go to ask them questions. You know, that's right. that's where we go and we interact and we post each other articles and things like that. If you want documents from us or anything like that, they know to dial home. They know to Brilliant. phone home. They know to come to the website. If we've got a guest on and we're going to be talking declassified documents that night, they know to go to the website and the documents there and they can download it and they can read it with us, you know. Stuff like that. And and that's right. what your website's supposed to be used for. And your social media is supposed to be used for engaging people and telling Brilliant. people about home. If and you want more, come on by the house. 
Yeah, I, I, I really like the way you're putting this because it really does speak volumes. Come on home, come on buy the house. Exactly. Yeah. Not buy the house as in yeah. purchase it. Stop by. Come we'll on, have buy some the coffee. house as in come <laughs> round and see us. It's a- but the really important thing there is your Facebook page needs to link to your house. Yep. And your house needs to link to your Facebook page. That that two way relationship yes. needs to be very clear to Google. And number two, you've made a very interesting point that I hadn't really thought about before which is that when podcast name, Google wants to show the Facebook page because it's another aspect of the way you're presenting yourself to that's your right. audience. Yep. And so it's going to say, here's the website, that's the home, here's the Twitter account, here's the Facebook account, and that's why social accounts rank so well for brand names, podcast names, people's names, because it's... a uh, a, a communication with the audience that's different from the home that you were talking about. And Google wants to show that balanced view and that balanced way of interacting with us to give the choice to its users of how it wants to interact yeah. with this entity, this person, this podcast, this brand, or this album, whatever it might be, that we've searched for, which is delightful. Thank you very much for teaching me that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we, we learn every day. However much I think I know about this stuff, and I've been doing it for seven years, I talk to people, they say something, and I think, hadn't thought of it from that perspective. And I think that's really important is keep your mind open to different perspectives because different perspectives move you forward. Keep keep your mind and your ears open, folks, because if you're not challenging your, your <laughs> realm of knowledge on the daily, you are not doing yourself a favor. Brilliant. Absolutely. Like, I mean, like I said, I, I wanted to have you on, I mean... This is probably, hands down, folks, the most selfish episode of Talking Sound that has ever occurred. Not going to lie. Um, because I need this information, man. Like uh, like I said, I'm a front-end designer. Um, hmm. when it ca- I know a lot of these good and good practices, like having the social media account. Um, but it's also, it's also the fact of meet your audience where they are. If you're, yeah. in a, if you're in a band or you're a musician that's focusing on 50-plus... As your audience, you know, if you're like Spyro Gyra, let's say, hey, maybe you don't have a TikTok. I, I don't know no, a I, lot of 50 plus people engaging in TikTok. So maybe you don't put your effort there and you also don't waste your SEO by having a TikTok that does nothing. Right. I, I, and that's sorry. That's actually something we've built into Cali Q Pro. I mean, I'm not trying to sell it. Because no, no, no. I want you tool. to sell it. Well, it's actually an agency tool, so I don't sell it directly to okay. clients. I, you have to go through an agency because it's actually really complicated, high-level uh, stuff. But, you know, I mean, an agency can use this, and you can work with an agency who can do the work. And it's relatively simple. But one of the things that we do is identify social media accounts, the social media platforms that dominate within an industry. Mm. So within the music industry, I can tell you which social platforms will dominate. And as you said, you know, yeah. sorry, we can go for industry, um, entity type, i.e. music group or person, and country. And we can tell you what's dominating and therefore where you should be focusing. So, yeah. for example, TikTok will not be dominating for old people's music. Yeah. In, yeah, in the U.S. Well, and that's just it, you know. Like, I, whenever I speak at conferences, and I'm a lot of the times, um, I mean, Podcast Cadet even is focused a lot toward people looking to podcast for business, you know, right. um, people looking to, as we say in the commercial, to become a trusted voice in an industry. That's how we put mm. it in the broadcast terminology. Is right. that like you aren't tuning in to? You, the reason you buy products that Rush Limbaugh recommends is because you trust what 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 Rush Limbaugh says. Like that, that's why you buy it. You know, it's it's that trusted voice concept, and it's the same thing whenever you're selling ad space or whatever. Um, it's the fact of no, this podcast may not be going out to a hundred thousand people like a print ad locally, but it is going out to ten thousand people, and those ten thousand people are directly in the niche of your marketing. So the uh, the odds on favorite of converting to a sale are a whole lot better than you taking an ad out in a general circular in your area. 
Brilliant. And it actually comes back to what I was talking about with the keyword research. If you do want to write an article, write an article where you're incredibly pertinent, even if it's a smaller potential audience because the search volume is smaller, it's an audience who are actually going to be interested in what you've got to offer. Yeah. So don't get greedy. Don't try to rank for music. Try to rank for uh, folk punk groups from France in the 1990s because even though you will only attract 20 people, those 20 people are going to be phenomenally interested in what it is you've got to offer. Well, and it's not just, it's also the fact of that the interaction is quality interaction. Much like yeah. any backlink, like I could backlink to any website in the world. The question is, do they get quality traffic? Do they have, do they have quality yeah. SEO? Those are the backlinks that you want. You want backlinks to quality websites that Google is already recommending to begin with. So it's no good writing, writing a surfer's weight that doesn't know how to surf. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important point as well with the, the linking is don't be afraid to link to other sites. Yeah. A lot of people are afraid. They think, oh, I'm giving away my super duper SEO juice. Um, you're not. You're growing you're, it. You're linking to helpful resources. That's right. This is how Google functions. This is how bots function. This is how human beings function. I'm on your site. I'm not going to spend my entire life sitting on your site, listening to your music and reading your yeah. rubbish descriptions. I want to discover more. And if you provide me that springboard, the link to a resource that is interesting to me, I will remember you fondly. That's right. That's and right. That's incredibly important. I think even, even outside of the marketing, outside of the idea of building up my fan base. Yep. Just being a good human being and helping people out is delightful because I love it when people do it for me. Oh yeah. And I've, I would I've, like to do it for other people. I've literally gotten cease and desist for doing it. Oh, right. Because, <laughs> you know, you like, maybe do it too much then. Yeah? Well, well, I mean, granted, at one point I started kind of like a, a Drudge Report style site that was like RSS populated, but it was just news. Um, it was not monetized in any way, shape or form. Mm. Everything came in full raw RSS. It all was attributed to the authors, did not replace any images, used their images. And yeah, I got a cease and desist from NBC News. Um, but that's wow. also how you know you did a decent job in some Google stuff if NBC found you <laughs> and found out the fact it. that you were posting their RSS, you know? Um, so yeah, but doing, doing old school things like having a links page, you know, um, that mm. link back to other bands that you enjoy or, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff. So hugely important and overlooked. I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, I, I link out to bands that I appreciate. My audience appreciates yeah. that I'm giving these handy hints and recommendations and the other bands appreciate it and potentially link back to you, but you don't need to, you don't need that link back. It's not an exchange. It's a, I like you guys. There you go. Yeah, it's um, a curse. And, and, yeah, and the, the, the web is built that way. And yep. that's the way it should be built. And I think the long-term payback is, is, is there. Come back to marketing a music group. I mean, marketing is kind of this maybe dirty word for a lot of artists. It's actually just, as you said earlier on, and I think I'd, I'd love to kind of circle back and perhaps end on this point. Go ahead. Saying, you need to go and find your audience where your audience are already hanging out. You need to communicate to them. You need to reach out to them. You need to bring them in on that social platform, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on TikTok, if it happens to be TikTok, if you're young, and bring them yeah. back to your home. Then you will have this fan base who are going to be searching your your name on google google will start to understand who you are because your site your home is so brilliant you you described who you are what your albums are what your songs are who your audience is and it will start to a provide the people searching for your name because they saw you on twitter with a great presentation of you when they do search your band name but it will also start pushing you towards new people through Google Discover. And all of these other algorithms, Twitter, Facebook, Apple, Bing, will also do the same thing. So we're ending yeah. up in this situation is these machines want to understand who you are, what, what you do, and who your audience is. And at that point, they can start to offer you up to their users 
when they think their users are going to be incredibly interested in what it is you're doing. And that's where you start to win the game. Yeah, precisely. Precisely. And it, it, like you said earlier, it may take a hot ticket minute. I mean, you know, it, it takes a good three, four months for Google. If you're even posting once a week to see you and to yeah. algorithmically figure out, okay, that dude on a regular basis is doing this, you know? Yeah. Um, so you gotta, you gotta play that game. I remember one of the first articles I ever read about podcasting was literally tired. Podcasting, be ready to be alone for a long time. <laughs> And it was like, you may seem like you're talking to yourself, but keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. You will be found. It will happen. You just have to keep doing it. And, you know, coming at it from that artist perspective of does it matter if you sell an album or are you making music for art's sake? Because if you're making it for art's sake, you're going to keep making it. And you're going to keep doing it. That discouragement of like, well, I guess, you know, that album didn't sell to anybody um, doesn't really hit as much because you're making music for music's sake. You're making art for art's sake. Um, and then at that point, it's a lot easier to play that long game and see that turnaround happen, you know? Yeah, and and that that is a great one. You just said play that long game. And I think we... A lot of people imagine the internet as this magic bullet where it all works incredibly quickly, incredibly successfully, yeah. and we suddenly get 100,000 people coming to our website or buying our album because we happen to have put a web page online. It's not, it, like anything in life, it's a long game. Yep. Yep. And, and you it, need to be good and you need to be consistent. You need to be convinced and you need to make sure that you're communicating with the right kind of audience in the right kinds of places. It's a long game. Stick with it. Yeah. Don't give up, but be intelligent about where you're placing your efforts. Yes, yes. I could not agree more. We're going to go Thank out you. on that and give you one last chance for shameless, shameless self-promotion. Before we let you go, Jason, I can I cannot thank you enough. I am so glad that we we met via mutual virtual handshake. Yeah, Um Man, like my, my fingertips are tingling. I cannot wait to start applying things today. Uh, that we have, that, that's how I know, like my brain is activated. My fingers are wanting to move. They're wanting to do things. So, uh, tell everybody one last time where they can go to find out about Cali Cube, the tools that you provide, where, where they can even come if they are a record label, um, anything like that, where they can come to become part of that. Uh, upper tier of product that you provide. Right, yeah. Uh, CaliCube Pro, basically a platform that helps you if you are a big company or an agency to build that presence, the knowledge panel, uh, the brand set. I'm not saying that other people can't use it. I'm saying that it, it probably isn't appropriate, but if you're interested in this stuff, read my articles. If you search for my name, Jason Barnard, you will see Search Engine Journal about halfway down on the Google results page. And at that point, I recently wrote an article, How to Get a Knowledge Panel for People. And it describes exactly what I've been talking about today, which is create that entity home, make sure you've got, as you said earlier on, the URL that you own, where you can describe who you are, what you're doing, who your audience is. And you can really, there you go, that, that's the one. And it's the latest article there. And it explains basically what you need to do. You don't need CaliCube Pro. You can browse those to help people save time. And this is a simple explanation a professional do, but you can actually just do it on your own. So there isn't any need to buy a product. Um, so I'm obviously selling myself short here, but I really want to share this information because I think it's incredibly important, incredibly helpful, and it empowers people to start controlling what Google is showing about them when people search their name, their brand name, or their band name and start to make sure that when they've built that audience on other platforms, Google is showing what they want to be shown, what you want to be shown, your message, so that you can keep, retain, encourage, charm that audience through their activity on Google. And I would love it if everybody could do that for free. And, you know, the fact that, 
somebody like you with your years of experience and with the consulting program as vast and covering as this is, is even like, hey, here it is for free, man. Just go yeah. do it. Uh, I love that. I love that. I love it. Um, yeah. Because it is all about that sharing of information. That's what makes the world go round, man. Um Exactly. I mean, and that's the point is I'm writing all these articles. I do videos. If you go to the Cali Cube uh, YouTube channel, I've got videos on there explain all the theory, all the practical advice. All Cali Cube does is make it scalable for agencies and big business. Wow. So for anybody who isn't an agency or a big business, you can just do it yourself. You just need to watch all these videos and, and read the, read the articles because I'm sharing it because I don't think that this is any enormous secret that I need to keep for myself because I'm never going to be able to serve a hundred million people in the world yeah. who need this service. 99.999 million people can do it themselves and I will keep the big clients who then try and scale out. I mean, obviously I'm giving away my business model, but my business model isn't to make an enormous amount of money. It's to make a decent living and to keep researching yeah. and keep understanding, keep chasing that machine that I'm never going to catch, yeah. trying to understand how Google functions in its little brain so that we can make sure that Google presents us in the way that we want to be presented and we don't just leave it to chance. Absolutely. Well, once again, everybody, that website is calicube.pro. Uh, feel free to stop on by jasonbarnard.com. You can find all of his podcasts, everything there. Musician, like just search his name, Jason Barnard, and I guarantee you, you will find everything that we have been talking about today. Jason, once again, I cannot thank you enough for coming on. Um, I cannot wait to talk to you yeah. for the podcast cadet series and go into this even deeper right. for those folks. Um, such valuable information. Please do hold the line while we close things out real quick. While you are online checking out all of the amazing work of Jason Barnard and Calicube Pro, make sure to stop on by Facebook, everybody. Join the Talking Sound group. Uh, that's where you can join the conversation. The page is where all the articles post, uh, all the, all the episodes post and then come here. But we also post articles from great manufacturers, uh, fantastic stuff, just all about the audio video industry, even web design, graphic design, all kinds of stuff. Stop on by and check that out. Become a member. Uh, it's on Facebook. It's free. We charge nothing. Great conversations. Come join us. While you're there, make sure to stop on by Talking Sound Podcast or stop TalkingSoundShow.com. That's where you can find all the episodes. That's where you can find the gear shop. We are busy rebuilding our industry news feed right now with all kinds of new uh, great stuff and great manufacturers. Um, and of course, while you're doing that, make sure to stop on by True Hemp Science, our sponsor. Uh, True Hemp Science is some of the greatest CBD product that I have found in my time on the road. They are based right here in Austin, Texas. I am actively a user of them. Stop on by. Use the code TALKING7 to get 7% off your entire cart of $50 or more and get two, count them, two free edibles on your way out the door at TrueHempScience.com. Until next time, everybody, take care of yourselves, take care of your hearing, and keep reaching for 11. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Talking Sound Podcast. For more episodes, industry news, and information, visit us online at TalkingSoundPodcast.com. Subscribe to the Talking Sound Podcast on Amazon Audible, Spotify, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service. Get the latest Talking Sound videos on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Reach TV, or your Roku or Amazon Fire device with the APR TV app. Talking Sound is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great shows and content, subscribe to hcuniversalnetwork.com today. Until next time, watch those meters, gig safely, and keep reaching for 11. Sound.